big thanks to um, Jose and all the crew. And let's get started. Um, We don't like show anyway, so I guess it's... Yeah, I'm going to put the mission on. Oh, exactly. <laughs> my uh, system's broke. Or, uh, well, you did connect to my access point, so... My, so yeah. Could you mind uh, undoing that? My uh, power point's broken. There's not frozen thing yet. The gesture's frozen. Can you try the... No, it's not going to be... Have you tried uh, the keys? The arrow keys? Yeah, no, it's, it's, everything's moving on my screen. It's just not moving on the projector. That's weird. That's weird. Let me stop the slideshow and start up again. Yeah, the... Uh, There you go. Okay, I just I killed the tower point, so let me bring it up again. Sorry, folks. Next to the ocean, so I'm half surfer, half cowboy, and, and, and half Californian. So my accent's uh, hard to place. Uh, I want to thank Jose everybody for the opportunity to come out here. Um, I have been nothing but amazed with your city and country. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm, it again. I'm on the, I'm on slide. I'm on slide three. You sure this is not you, Jason? Pretty sure it's not me. Um, Slide three. Let me, uh, oh, uh, no, just try to resync it. Okay. I got nothing. Give me the, the, what, the uh, size of your screen. Yeah. Uh, you're going you're gonna to hopefully, hopefully see my notes. Hey, come on in. There you here, go. Here we go. Okay. You're going to see my notes and comments, and you're going to miss some of my really cool animation. Um, but I'm afraid this is going to be as good as it gets. So. a pretty good coder, um, and a few years ago I went to management for work-life balance. Um, and what I, what I found is that um, everything I knew was a hacker, I can go to my management and say, here's what is important, and they, they had a blank look on their face. 
what this talk is about is, is taking how to how to take your security skills, apply your business, you know, and, and apply business knowledge so you can get your security needs met in your organization. Here we go. This is a slide that always sticks up. Huh? There you go. Uh, thank you. So this is this is just purely hypothetical, but it's a great place to start. So you, in your organization, you're using the software. It's you, this software you're using using for the organizations. And some of your peer companies, when you, when you do a risk assessment, when you talk about your peer companies, some of your peers have been, been breached from a vulnerability in the software, and you have the same software. So the probability of you being breached is 75%, probably a lot higher. The impact you know is a million dollars. So here's the question. If you can spend $50,000 on a web and reduce the cost, and reduce the likelihood of breach by 50%, is that a good business decision? So mathematically, is buying a web a good business decision? Well, if you do it on the next slide, you cross your fingers and hope it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if it's a million dollar breach, we know that, and we can predict that the risk reduction is 75% uh, to reduce the, the by two. So essentially, you, what you've done here is you've got you know three hundred thirty-five thousand dollars minus the cost for a WAF. What you've done is you've saved the company three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Now, you, what you've just done is you've saved them over half a million dollars, almost half a million dollars. You're going to get a big bonus, a big promotion. You're now a superstar the company, right? Mm -hmm. So raise your hand. If you've ever received a bonus for recommending a WAF, <laughs> you have You have not gotten a bonus for receiving a WAF. Um, you just, we, I lost, part of this is I've lost my, my cheat sheet, so I'm going to have to go uh, see my cats here. Um, but the, the, the point of this talk is, within, if, if this was just buying stocks and bonds, it's black and white. You did the math, you buy them, you're a rock star, you get a bonus. With security, no one here has ever gotten no one here has ever gotten an attaboy for suggesting you spend money, and that's because with with security, what what's happened is security has become an emotional decision versus a business decision, and, and I'm going to talk more about that. And, and part of the fault for that is our own. We, we've actually uh, done that to ourselves. But what this talk is going to do is going to take it's going to take how to go from security being an emotional decision to being a business decision. So um, and at this point, I was going to, I'm afraid to do it. I've got an Excel sheet. Um, I was going to get an example on, but I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to risk that. Can someone, can someone here give me an example of something they recommended at their company organization that was shot down? Does anyone have a good example? Disconnecting the internet. Powering <laughs> <laughs> off the servers. Um, anyone have an example they want to share? Okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not track the example, so I'm going to open up my, my Excel sheet at the moment. So this is, this is kind of security 101. Your security policy should be aligned to what? What should you align your security policy to? Somebody. So, so you, the processes? Well, security about the, your security policy, and this is going to sound really CISSP-like, but security policy should be aligned to your mission statement, which is just a fancy way of saying your security policy should match your business requirements, right? So if, if you're working with, if, 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 you're, if you make your, if your company makes its living with intellectual property, and if that property were compromised, you're gonna spend a lot of money protecting it. But if your company, if your company kind of juggles publicly available information, it doesn't make good business sense to spend a lot of money protecting the confidentiality of that information. So, um, in most organizations, and the reason we're all here today, is that there can be obstacles when you implement a security program. So why, why are there obstacles? Um, I, had some great, I had a great cheat sheet of notes here to talk about this. But uh, if I recall, so if, if you look at this, if you, if you have problems implementing a security program, it's gonna fall into one of these buckets, right? It's either, Either you have not done an adequate job educating or influencing your leadership on why security aligns with their mission. Uh, your vision may go way beyond the organization's mission, and that happens, that happens to me all the time. Uh, your management is stupid and doesn't get security, or your organization's mission is not driving your group's priorities. And what that means is uh, that the bottom one is what I call wild, wild west, and that means that you, the people you're interacting with 
what they're doing and how they're doing it, why they're doing it, doesn't necessarily match your readerships. So what I've done is I've taken this and I've actually turned this into a table of contents for the rest of the talk. Uh, dealing with stupid management, I've replaced with how information to pity people sabotage their own efforts. So let's talk about your leadership. Okay, so here's, here, here's the hard truth. Um, as important as security is, and as, as valuable as we are, and, and, and why we're the most important people in the company, we're not the kings and queens. Um, decision, decisions about security and security spending and security processes happen way above your heads. Uh, now, now, for me, I wish I was the king, I wish I was the boss, I wish I controlled everything because we'd have phenomenal security, but the reality is there's people above the food chain from you who, who are making decisions, holding the first strings and deciding how money is spent. So what we're gonna talk about is how we, how we manage the people above us, how we influence organizational leadership. So there's, I have three keys for managing upwards. You gotta have face time, you gotta speak a common language, and you have to provide something actionable. So getting FaceTime, you know, the, the, the bit, calling, calling, up, calling up the really big people of your, of your uh, organization and asking for ad hoc meetings isn't going to work real well. What I find is, it is to go ahead and schedule a monthly review, get, get an hour in the calendar, if you can't, half an hour will work. Um, get an hour in the calendar just to go in there and, and talk about security. And, and people say, well, I can just, you send them an email. I don't care how great an email you write, your email is never going to be as good as your face-to-face -face meetings. So I've got a sample agenda. So when you go there, have scorecards. Uh, you know, the, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. With, uh, a scorecard is worth a thousand words. You know, RYG stands for red, yellow, green. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually get the scorecards with you know, and review your major accomplishments, review any incidents you've had that month, and go ahead and list your top risk. Always have a risk assessment to tell them why it's a risk, saying it's bad, won't work, and then you ask. When you go to meet with your top management, be very clear what you're gonna ask for, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But here's, here's, a, here's a sample scorecard I have. So, because this talk is about the SDLC, what you have here is you have four, you have, uh, four applications, you know, you've got application one, there was a final for web inspect. It had four highs, 12 mediums, six lows. Bill Smith is the owner, and here's the date he put it doing it fixed. Uh, and it's the same thing. If you go down here to application two, this one's red because Jan Jones promised it in January, and it's not done yet. So what this does is it immediately tells your management, here's the vulnerabilities we have, here's who's in charge of fixing them, and here's what will be fixed. Okay, so what you've done is in one snapshot, you've, you've, you've said, your manager can look at this and she can say, you know, get me Jan Jones on the phone, I wanna know why that's not fixed. Um, you also wanna go there cognizant of who in your organization can be hurt with a non-compliance, right? So there's, a, there's an unspoken question, your manager's gonna have a question she may not ask, but the unspoken question is, so what? You know, so you've got, you've got, 12, you've got 12 medium findings application one, right? So what? Why does, why does she care? So when you go in to talk about this, you need to be able to tell her why she should care about those. And more importantly, uh, who can be hurt by that? Maybe, maybe someone she hates can be hurt by it. Um, you also want to know who is responsible to fix it, uh, and you want to know who their managers are. So when she says, I don't know who Jan Jones is, you can say, oh, Jan Jones reports to Jason Street. And she'll say, give me Jason Street on the phone. Um, and the last one is who can be here with a brief. So you, you want to go in there, what, you want to go in there with the, what needs to be fixed and why it matters to them. So some simple rules about scorecards. And, and, and you're, you're going to piss off a lot of people with scorecards. You're, the minute you start sending these, you're going to get a lot of nasty phone calls. But so some simple rules. Uh, as tempting as it is, never, ever, ever use a scorecard to ambush somebody. Um, Always give them a heads up, let them know the data's coming, and, and most importantly, give them a chance to fix it. Give them a really good chance to fix it. You're not here, your, your goal here isn't to damage people's reputation, your goal here is to get the stuff fixed. Uh, the other one is always be able to explain each item and the status of it. If you give your management a scorecard and an item, and, and they say, what's this, and say, I, I don't know, you've lost all your credibility. Um, 
and, and also, if, you, if you've got a score from you up again, if you go up here, and the reason this is red is because Jan Schell will go over to your email or phone calls, have that documented. You want to you go in there and you want to you know what you're talking about, or you'll, you'll, it'll be the last face-to-face -face you have. Um, we're going to skip the examples today. Um, number two is speak a common language, and, and I'm not talking about Spanish and English. I'm, I'm talking about business speak. Um, you know, in, in security, we know I can I can tell her there's a SQL and I can, I know what I mean when I say we've got a SQL injection vulnerability, but your management won't know that. Um, and, and tie it to the business. So you know, instead of saying there's a SQL injection vulnerability, say that that. Uh, Here's a server, here's a business process for that server. The, the data can be exposed, and here, here's where that's a bad thing, and it impacts, it impacts sales, or it impacts this or that. Um, tie recommendations to a published framework, and make, make the regulatory requirements your friend. We're gonna get to those in a minute, but um, this is a hacker conference, and hackers tend to be notoriously, um, uh, what's the word, notoriously uh, anti-regulatory requirements. It, when it, once you go into management, they're going to become your best friends. Um, yeah, so, so, so your, your, your common business language. So pra pra you know, practice referencing specific business processes. Uh, you know, this example here is pretty simple, but replace you know, would be bad with would prevent communication with supplier ABC preventing sales of 500,000 widgets. Um, and you'd be probably wondering why, you probably can't see it, but if you could see it, you'd be wondering why I've got a, a DVD with a screen capture of SQL map. Um, and, and as an example, early, early, on, early on in my career, when I first kind of got my shot, um, I found a potential SQL injection vulnerability. I went to my management and said, oh my God, oh my God, we've got this potential SQL injection vulnerability. And no one cared. They looked at me like I was nuts. And in my, in my kind of immature mind, I decided it's because I said potential. And I said I confirmed SQL injection vulnerability, everyone would have cared. So I went back and confirmed and said, I confirmed that we've definitely got a SQL, SQL injection vulnerability, we definitely have one, and no one cared. They, they, they didn't care. So I was being young and stupid and kind of lucky, I went back and said, here's a DVD, I dumped your database. And I worked for a company at the time who, instead of firing me for do that, kind of harnessed my passion and enthusiasm and taught me ways to take my enthusiasm for dumping databases and turn it into how to get things fixed. And long story short, I led a team that fixed it and happy they were after. So that's what I mean by, by speaking the business. If you go there and say potential SQL injection vulnerability, be prepared for no one caring. Okay, um, I, I talk about frameworks, and, and, and like I said, frameworks, as a hacker frame, uh, or a pen tester, frameworks not, may not mean much to you. But when you go to your management, if you go to your management and say, I don't like the way we're doing our SDLC, they're going to say, so what? If you go to your management and say, you know, o OWASP is the authority on SDLCs, they put out this framework called SAM, and here's the area we're not compliant with SAM, you've got a lot more credibility. What you've done is, you've, instead of you saying, Here's my opinion, you've said, here are the experts, and, and here's my assessment on where we're not meeting this framework. Now, the, the, we're, we're assuming that they'll, they'll care about the framework, they may or may not, but the reality is, is said as it sounds, OWASP has more credibility than you do. And what you've done by that is you've provided a measurable objective, you know, here's where we're not compliant, so you've got something you can graph, remember executives love charts and graphs. Um, you're using a published, a published industry accepted framework, so they can't say, oh Mike, you're, always, you're too conservative, oh Mike, you're a worry wart. They've got OWASP to contend with. Um, the, the last one's the important one, and, and the last one is, instead of you going to your organization and saying, you guys suck, you're going to the organization and saying, hey, you're not meeting this framework. Now what you've done is you've distanced themselves. You're not, if you go and say, hey, you guys suck, you're the messenger and you get killed, if you go and say, I found this industry standard framework, they've got reading material, it's got credibility, um, on and on and on. So you, I mean, you don't have, I really like the OWASP SAM, I, I really think it's a, a fantastic piece of work, but there's lots out there you can use, but just an example. Um, that's a framework. So, um, regulatory requirements, or no, still frameworks. Um, reg regulatory requirements. So, with, with NIST. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I 
was a pen tester and security assessor, I didn't care about this. I didn't care about any regulatory requirement. I had one requirement, and that can the bad guys get their computing systems or not. And that was a requirement. And when I got out uh, into the broader world, it turns out there's all these, there's contracts to contend with, regulators, there's auditors, and it was this whole big crazy world. Um, and instead of fighting these things, embrace them. Now, if I, if I came into you and said, as a bunch of pen testers, follow this, and we're great as pen testers, you'd say, no, no, no. But the reality is, um, the, all these different regulatory requirements, have they all have things that require at certain activities in the SDLC. And, and I'm really excited. NIST, NIST 4 hasn't come out yet. They, that's still in draft. The finals are this month. And they've beefed up software security assurance and software testing a lot. So figure out, figure out what regulatory environment your organization is covered by. It may not be mandatory, it may be suggested, but like, like the frameworks, you can use this and say, here's where we're falling short. So everything I said about the value of using the framework, the value of a regulatory requirement is there, but the, the difference between a regulatory requirement and a framework is, if you don't meet this, you can be in trouble. With the framework, you can't be in trouble. Actionable. So the last thing is, you, you spent all this time to get your ongoing meeting with your executive. You go there and you give them all this great information, and you, you've done a phenomenal job. And my question to you then is, so what? Why? What? What have you accomplished? And what? What you accomplished is you have to go in there, and and you have to have what you're you're asked for. You have to be able to tell your executive management, here is what I need you to do for me, and it has to be something they respond to. So. But my first example here is, if you go to your executive management and say, I want your help making security better. That's a great thing to ask, a great goal, and that's very important, but they're gonna look at you and go, yeah. If you go to your management and say, I would like your help in putting a policy in place that no untested code gets put into production. They can go, great. They can wave their magic wand, they can pass a policy, and you know, you've, you've made security better, but you've given them something actionable. So when you when you talk to your executives, and they, they call this an elevator conversation, because if you ever are in an elevator with a really senior executive, you've got about 30 seconds to tell them what you want. So when you when you go in here to one of these meetings, have your elevator conversation ready. Instead of saying, I want your help making security better, they're gonna say, yeah. Say, I want your help putting a policy in place that no one has to go as code for the question, they'll say fine. R write it up in an email to me and I'll send it out. Okay, so when your vision doesn't apply. So, it, it, and, and this, this, um, this is what's called a bitter pill to swallow and it takes, it's something that just takes a lot of maturity to get over. Um, but it's when you, when what you want, when your vision of what a good security program doesn't match the business need. And this is this is a discussion, so I need you all to, to interact. But let's, there's a hypothetical scenario. You're the security manager for an online online shopping site, and on Cyber Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving, you guys do about half a million dollars in revenue. Okay, it's your big big day. It's like one of your big, it's your biggest day of the year. Ten percent of your income. Okay, you as security manager, one of your people calls you and says, "Holy smokes, we've got customer data being." actively exfiltrate it out, and there's no way to stop without bringing the entire site down for 10 hours, okay? And because you're a good security manager, you, you've already done your analysis, you already know what it means to be down, and you know what, you know what the fines and penalties would be for, for the data, and you know that it's gonna be about a half million dollar hit, right? So, to recap, you're, today, today, during your business day, you're gonna, you're gonna make half a million dollars. Because some bad guy somewhere is actually trying to customer data, you're going to lose half that. Now, to bring your site down for 10 hours means you'll lose all of that. So as a security manager, you have to make, you have to make a recommendation. Do you bring the site down and let all the data and, and have no sales? Or do you let the people exfiltrate the data and lose half a million dollars? So I've got two questions down here because there's, there's kind of two different answers. What's the correct business response? It's kind of obvious. One, you lose half a million dollars. 
one unit is a quarter million dollars, right? And, and you just have to trust me that there, there's no way except for the 10-hour outage, okay? What's your emotional response? As a security guy, I hate being breached. As a security guy, the idea of it being in the newspaper, that this company was breached on my Plandex watch bothers me. Um, in fact, it bothers me enough, it's really hard to, in my head, I know the obvious choice. In my heart, it's not an obvious choice, and that's, this is how I'm gonna lead you into when your visions don't align, because as security people, we like a lot, we, we, we chose this profession for a reason. We're not, we're not here for the fame and glory, we're here because we like protecting data. Um, and here's, here's the complicating factor, so let's go back. To this one, I, I, what did, anybody have any thoughts on that? You have to be all right with the with the business. Your your choice is clear. You may not like the choice, but your choice is clear. <coughs> this is a really extreme example. In your day to day lives, you're going to find less extreme examples, and you you may find throughout your your career and your work day that maybe you are asking more for more security than the, than the business justification requires. I, I like security, I like more security. I'm always asking for more security, and I have to catch myself and, and you know, do a cost-benefit analysis of is this justified. Okay, complicating factors. Your, your executive leadership will always state that security is important to them, and they're, they're usually secure about this, they're sincere about this. Uh, the complicating factor is what they believe is enough security may not match yours. You and your executives have been have differences on what adequate security is. Okay, the disconnect here. So here, here's three questions to ask yourself. Do, you, do your executives define security and its scope and its requirements the same way you do? Yeah. If someone asks your executives what's, what's, what's the role of security or the requirements for security, is your management gonna give the same answer you do? Uh, if you were at, to ask your executive why security is important, not, not the first one, why it's required, if you were to say, why is it important to the organization? Would their answer match yours? And lastly, if you get all the executives in a room together and ask them those questions, would their answers match each other's? And as long as the answer is no, you, you're gonna have alignment problems. You know, so um, it, when, when this happens, and I'm gonna talk more about risk assessments, you know, um, when this happens, risk assessments are your friends. You're gonna write, you're gonna write up for every area of security you disagree on, the risk assessment is what's the risk of not implementing what you want? You know, what's the probability, what's the likelihood? And you're gonna give it to them. And here's the hard part. You can write that up and you can paint a picture and you can write a justification and give them the world's greatest risk assessment and say here's the risk. And if they choose to accept that risk on behalf of the business, you're done. You accept it and you walk away. And then I put down here a that risk assessment for an annual event. Most, most regulatory uh, requirements say you do it once a year. So if, if, you got, if, they didn't, if your management didn't get away the first time, do it again next year. But the, but kind of the takeaway from this is, write the risk assessment, do a really good job. Document from the heart and from, from metrics and from facts why it's an issue, what the cost is, what the risk is. And if, it, if your management chooses to accept it, you walk away, you're done. And, and you let it go. And it's easier said than done. So this, this is a fun one. So I don't know, my, um, when I was a kid, my grandma always used to say, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Meaning something you have is more valuable than two of something you don't have. And it turns out a bunch of guys that get some big school, uh, named that prospect theory. And this is, what's interesting about this is it, is it impacts security quite a bit. So, pro, and this is kind of text science but it says prospect theory says that a decision maker will underweight outcomes that are merely probable in comparisons to outcomes that are obtained with certainty. So what that says is, and if you reverse that, if you go with your risk assessment and say this might happen, you say there's a 50% probability it will happen. They'll hear 50%, but in the heart, it's less than 50. So what this says is, 
what, what this says is when you talk to your decision makers, be prepared to have the emotions override the business metrics. It just happens. It's human. They're human. Uh, I talked about our earlier WAF example, where you know, it was pretty clear you spent fifty thousand to save three hundred seventy-five thousand. The reality is that the, the fifty thousand they had in their hand, the three hundred and seventy-five was theoretical, so they felt fifty thousand was more valuable. The um, the again the, again the implication for security professionals is to be mindful of this even call it out. I actually met with one of the very senior VP, and for the first part of the meeting, I explained prospect theory to her, and how that would impact her decision making for what I was going to ask her next. So I actually prefaced the meeting with, I'm going to ask you for something, there's this human conditional impact you're thinking, I need to be mindful of it. And, and I wasn't fired, wasn't kicked out, and she thanked me for it. Um, and lastly, and here's my, my, my slide of an ex important executive guy, but it's interesting, they've done research on prospect theory, and one of the findings is that the higher up the food chain you are, the, the higher a manager you are, the less prone you'll be to emotional decisions of prospect theory. So when you talk to people lower in the organization, they'll be more influenced by these emotional decisions. The people higher up the food chain are more, more metrics-based and less emotional-based. Okay, dealing with stupid management. I, I scratched this out. And how information security people sabotage their effort? And I said that in the, when I first got up here was that part of the security decisions have to be made, be made emotionally versus business, and, and part of that is our fault. Um, what we've I, I just love this slide. So I, I'm going to take a break here. So you, you got this guy here saying we need to implement code reviews, vulnerability scanning, improve our release management processes and bring security early in the release cycle, life cycle. All really important things, all really good, okay? But if you approach, if you approach security management with the mentality that anyone who disagrees with you is wrong, stupid, or out of touch, you failed, okay? And, and I mean, no one in this room, but there are a lot of arrogant people in information security. And, one of the things that I like to keep in mind is that the goal of security management isn't to be right. The goal of being a security manager is to get the security program implemented that your business needs. Okay? If I was in this job to be right, I'd have, I'd have left a long time ago. Your goal is not to be right. Your goal is to get the program implemented that's best for your business. Yeah, and the, the bullets are switched for our own gun. So, um, and this is where I was talking about it, we've done this to ourselves. Um, there's, there, there's four ways security people sabotage themselves. And the first one is playing police behind. And it's, there's a, there is a strong push and pull in information security through the policeman. And, 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 there's, and in some organizations you are, and that's appropriate. You know, if you're, in, if, you're in, if you're in a compliance role, or if you're the one, the guy that's in charge of data loss prevention, your, your role is to be a policeman, that's fine. But in, in general, and, and especially in the SDLC, because we're talking about SDLC today, in the SDLC, your job is not to be a policeman. The minute people, the minute that your developers and project managers see you as a policeman, you're no longer providing consultation. Um, and you're no longer part of the team, but you're someone working against the team to keep them from their goals. If you're going to be successful in your SDLC, you have to be perceived as someone they can come to and ask questions of, get guidance of. They have to be able to come to you and say, I think we, we have some bad code here, can you help me? If they think they show you the bad code and you're going to ruin their career, they're not gonna bring the bad code to you. If they think they'll bring you the bad code and you'll tell them how to fix it, they'll bring the bad code to you. And that's really the issue with being a policeman. Um, and this is just kind of repeating what I said earlier. Um, in the, during the SDLC, you want to be perceived as a guide, not an enforcer. You want to be the guy who shows them how to do things right, not the guy who busts them for doing things wrong. And, and the way to, one way to get around this is 
you put policies in place and certain measurements in place um, that will do the dirty work for you, right? So people talk about security should make, be baked into an application from a defense in depth point of view. Security should also be baked into your processes. You want, you want to have pro your processes in place that check for bad code. You want processes in place that check for bad architecture. And lastly, it's, it's not your job to be the Lone Ranger. You, you don't want to be the security guy who goes around, you know, saving the world by, by busting developers. And we're going to talk a lot about developers in a little bit. Uh, the next way security people shoot themselves in the foot is by by saying no too much. Spending more time saying no than finding, you know, if your goal isn't to say no, your goal is to find compliant or secure alternatives, right? Um, and, and the reason that most SDLCs don't have hard gates for security, and they don't, and the reason is they don't trust us. They don't believe that we are going to take the SDLC and not abuse those hard gates to make everything perfect. Um, you know, never ever take away functionality without providing at least one acceptable alternative. If they want to do something and you say, no, you can't do that, you failed. If they want to do that and say, you know, if you do that, it's going to expose us to these problems, here's a better way to do that, then you're going to be successful. Find ways to make it work, and you're going to hear me use a lot today, but risk assessments are your friend. If they give you a really crazy architecture that's full of holes, and you simply say, uh, you suck, you're stupid, you're done. If you go and give them a risk assessment and say, you know, here's why it's, you can do that, but here's the bad things that could happen and why, and then you say, here's a better way to do that, you're now part of the team. You're a member of the team, you're contributing, and you're not a hard gate. Any questions on that so far? Okay. Oh. <laughs> you're gonna hear me talk about risk assessments a lot. And this, I think this is my last slide on risk assessments, so after this, we'll let it go. But risk assessments, that, and what they do, is they document, quantify, and communicate the actual reason for your decision. Um, you know, and, and, and this, bottom, this bottom bullet says it all. If you say, here's the probability of something bad happening, and the impact of that bad thing happening, you'd advance your career. If you say no, and they say, why are you saying no, and you said, because I said no, your, your career is done. Uh, the last thing they do is it actually will it'll show the leadership the risk they're accepting or not accepting. And the third thing is being arrogant. So, but I've talked about this a lot, but with, as security professionals, um, you've got this team that spent six months architecting this application, coding this application, building this great application, and the first five minutes you go and you get it. You tear it apart. Um, that, that can be a pretty powerful feeling. That, that, um, that, that can, um, you know, you can feel superior. You, know, you guys spent six months doing this. I get it in five minutes. I'm better than you worship me. Um, but I'm gonna, you know what, the answer to that is no one likes a jerk. So you may feel great inside, you may think you're the best, but all you've done at that point is you alienated yourself from your development teams. <laughs> um, there, there's, a, there's a great resource. A few years ago, a guy named Gene Bransfield, he was at a bunch of different conferences, we had to see him in a couple, and he had a whole presentation called Why Security People Suck. And he took what I'm talking about here and took it to a lot more detail. Go Google it, it's, it's worth watching. If you'll find it on YouTube and other places, Why Security People Suck is a, it's, it hits the nail on the head on, on all the things we do wrong. And the last one is fun. Um, I call it the other F word. It, it stands for fear and uncertainty and doubt. And this is where we've lost, as an industry, we, what, what's happened is it's, it's very powerful. You can go to your management and say, things are terrible, the sky is falling. If you don't implement security right now, you're going to be breached. And a few years ago, that worked. A few years ago, we could do that, we could stir things up, get people scared. But what's happened is, is that as, as a profession, we've overdone this and we've lost credibility. Where we used to be, you know, Mike says the sky is flying, let's respond. We've got, 
you know, Mike's one of those security guys, they're always, they're always overreacting. So, you wanna, you wanna go with the state. So, here's, I love, so here's a fun example. Movie Avatar. Who's the movie Avatar? Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the real badass guy, the, the colonel guy, who was, who, uh, you know, their, the goal of, the, goal, and the Avatar, what, the, what was their business mission? The mission of their business was? Unobtainium. To mine, what's that? To, to mine unobtainium. Oh, man, you just ruined my, you ruined, <laughs> you ruined my next slide. You ruined my well, next slide. Well, you asked the question. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 <laughs> their job was to mine this. That was their business mission. And they had some kind of, you know, like the Star Trek had that, uh, what was it called, uh, um, prime directive. They weren't supposed to mess with the locals, right? That was, they were supposed to mine Octanium and not mess with the locals. And what happened is this badass guy convinced everybody that really, really bad things were happening, okay? That, that terrible things were happening. And, and there was two, and, well, he, he played the fun card. He played on their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And for a while it worked, but two things happened. One, his success was short-lived. And always, if, you're, if you're getting your needs met through fear, you have to keep drumming up fear forever or else you're done. Facts and figures work much better. The other, the other thing he did is he totally distracted the business away from their, their business. They were no longer mining, they were blowing up stuff, okay? And here's the next slide that Jason just ruined. Just so it doesn't bother you for the rest of the con, the name of the mineral being mine was unobtainium. <laughs> and also it was the Navi, or the indigenous people, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the name of the mining company? Ah, oh, they got me. They went. <laughs> I don't know either. Oh, no, <laughs> I mean, you didn't catch me. I didn't really catch you. Okay, <laughs> so what, what's the problem with fun? You lose credibility, which I, I'm here to say as a profession, we've already crossed that line. We, we, the reason our jobs are harder now is from the sins of the past. And we're risking becoming the obstructionist we're accused of being, right? So by playing the FUD card, stopping the <laughs> we're making things worse. So use, use facts, not FUD. Oh, another great, re phenomenal resource. It's worth a read. It's, um, it's a book called Security Metrics. It's hard to see here. Replacing Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt. Um, with that, uh, Andrew just played. Phenomenal book. Um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's um, everything I want to know about security measures. Mission statement, not driving decisions. How are we doing on time? We're doing fast. Who was the owner? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You have four minutes, we're good. How many? Wow. Four minutes, but we're good. Okay, I'll, I'll talk fast. Okay. <laughs> security metrics, place in transfer, down below that. Mission statements, not driving decisions. So, in a healthy organization, and this is purely fantasy, in a healthy organization, security requirements are balanced with business need. You got your business needs, you've got security, they're perfectly balanced, no one fights, no one argues, you've got funding, you've got headcount, but not too much funding and not too much headcount is just right. Okay. What happens is when when you've got when you've got your business and you've got your business your business mission and the business isn't being run to meet the business requirements, things get out of whack. And, you, and, and, and the reason I, I call it leaders here is the leader's job to make sure that the business has what it needs to meet its <coughs> business mission and, and that those functions are happening. What happens is it becomes wild, wild west, okay? You've got people who want to get their jobs done and when security gets in the way, they ignore it. And then you've got security and as security people, when we think we're being ignored, what do we do? I, I come on bigger, I come on stronger, I come on harder, I come on meaner. And what you've got is you've got this polarizing effect. And because the bigger, meaner, and harder I come on, you've got some strong-willed program manager, and what's she going to do? Or he going to do? She's going to say, screw you, Mike. I'm not listening to you. And you've got, you've got what's happening here. And that's why... When you've, got your, when you've got your business mission, when you've got your business functions and missions not being met or not being followed through, security and the business tend to polarize. I've got a 15 second assessment of your organization. In my organization, security decisions are generally based on emotion, business analysis, 
politics and begging and pleading or fighting and fighting in war. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, you're in a perfect, the answer is in a perfect world, you've got your, your you know, business analysis. Uh, in the real world, it can be more than one. And, and sometimes that's as good as it gets. And if that's as good as it gets, you have to work with it. You, you, have, you have to be successful in this environment. So how do you do that? So when we come to work, there's two, there's two forces acting on us when we come to work and how we behave. There's who we are outside of work. And if you're a real jerk outside of work, you'll probably be a real jerk at work. Um, and the other thing is the role you're given. Okay, I, when I go home, I, I'm not, when I go to work, I'm being paid to do a certain function. And I'm gonna fulfill that function. And that function drives, and that function is what drives my behavior. So, what we have to look at is how different roles are incented. How is your, so how is your executives, how are your executives incented, or, or why? If they're incented for increasing revenue and reducing losses. You'd think they'd love us. We're all about reducing losses. Your program office, your program office gets their goodies by making things efficient and predictable. If your release processes and, uh, and everything involving SPLC is efficient and predictable, you've got a great program office and that's good. Project managers, they get their goodies based on on time delivery. Uh, your software developers, lines of code, lack of defects. Information security, we, we get, we, get, we get paid by reducing the loss of information security assets. Your testing teams, your quality assurance teams, compliance requirements, and your product managers, they get, they get their goodies based on happy users. So when you, look, when you look at these, you've got all these forces, and if you, if you look at them, the, the security activities you're recommending can interfere with all of these. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, some roles more than others. So there's a great Japanese quote. So there's a Japanese quote story about this, this smart, this wise guy in the hill. You can go up to the top of the hill, and if you're a man of peace, you can ask him whatever question you want. So this warrior goes up. He's got his swords, he's got his battle armor, he's got his, his um, trophies from previous battles. And he walks up to this old smart guy on the hill and he says, I'm a man of peace, I want to ask you a question. And the smart man says, who you are speaks so loudly they cannot hear the words you are saying. So, why do, why do we care about that? The um, reason that story is important here is I've never ever walked into an organization and had them tell me they don't take security seriously. You can walk into any organization in the world with security requirements and say, do you guys take security seriously here? And they'll always say yes. Um, most of the time they're sincere and sometimes they're lying. Um, but what the way, but if you, if you walk into an organization and you say who takes security and, and said, is security the most important function here? Of those roles, most likely only, only you are gonna say, your role's gonna say yes. If you change the question from do you take security seriously to is security the most important thing, all of a sudden, the answer changes. There's a lie. So we all, got, we all have our day job. We all have things we have to do. If we don't do them, we don't get our goodies. And there's a lie. And in most organizations, um, unless they're explicitly tied to the goodies, information security activities don't happen. And I'm gonna talk about that going forward. But if if you've got information security activities that are implemented because they're a good idea and not because they're required, you'll get paid for them, not because they're documented, measured, charted, or, or evaluated against, they're going to drop below the line. The way to get them above the line is to make them part of people's job descriptions, and we're going to talk about that. Specific, yeah, specific roles. So, software developers. Um, Here's a quiz for Jason. Snippet of code, loops through a file, anything less than seven characters, more than 64 characters gets dropped. What's, what's this, what function would that possibly serve? 
I got into social engineering so I wouldn't have to be technical. Exactly. It's a social engineering question. It uh, so uh, I love software developers. I used to be a software developer. I teach, I teach coding to kids. Um, so I'm not bashing software developers at all. I found three truths about software developers. They want to do a good job. They really don't have time to go to class or have you lecture them or, or read books because they're busy coding. And they tend to be really, really smart. Okay? Really, really smart. Now, the, the most success I've had in SDLCs is when I've gotten software developers, told them what I need them to do, gave them the tools to do it, and left them alone. Um, the minute you micromanage software development teams or something other than writing code, you're going to have a conflict. So, um, by providing software development teams with the tools to test their own code during unit testing, you're going to find that the, the, the vulnerabilities you find during your, your up testing later in the life cycle is going to drop dramatically. Um, you know, the, to, and when, you give a, when you give a software development team tools, they're not security for their software developers, so they need to be easy to procure because they, unlike you, they don't have a security budget. Uh, they need to be easy to learn and the reports have to be easy to interpret. Um, and like I said, since they tend to be smart, that's all relative. Um, you know, some examples, like W3AF, uh, it's free, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to learn, very easy to interpret. Um, you know, OWASP, BAP, the bed, bed attack proxy, very easy to, to procure, but not necessarily as easy to learn. And like Acumetics, a tool I, I really like, it's easy to use, easy to interpret, but it, it's expensive to be outside their budget. So when you when you talk to the teams, you have to you don't want to recommend any tool. You want to recommend a tool that they'll be successful with. Okay. Break. And, and it's, it's not in my bio, but I but, um, years and years and years ago I was in behavioral uh, science, behavioral health. I, uh, I did both uh, research and, and clinical practice. So a lot, of, a lot of my work kind of reflects that. And when you, um, when, when, someone, when someone has something bad happen, they go, th they go through these five stages, they call the five stages of disease. And these, these, these originally were identified when someone died, which is an extreme example. But it turns out when people go through something less traumatic or less tragic, they still go through these cycles. And, and this is just purely a Michelinicism. You won't find this in any textbook. You won't find anywhere. And over the years of my work as a software security assessor, talking to developers, I've watched them go through these. And I'll give you an example. I think you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But when you, when, you first, when you first go to a software development team and say, this, this code you've written, this product you've been working on, um, our testing has shown it has vulnerabilities. What kind of things do you hear? The, the first stage of denial, denial is when, when it, they don't, when their brain won't accept it. Your testing is incorrect, or that's not really a risk. Now you can show them, you know, and the, the first thing that happens is they'll say, well, that here's, why, here's why what you're saying isn't valid. That's the denial phase. Uh, the second phase of, of the five stages is anger, and you've probably seen this too. You know, security is always getting in the way. That's not a requirement. And my favorite is, you're an obstructionist. And I, I mean, anyone here who's done security assessments is probably with, with developers has probably seen both of these. Uh, the, third, the third stage is called the bargaining stage. And, I, and, and, and that's what happens next. And I, and I, I tell you, I, I've seen these. It's, you know, well, let's, if we let this critical vulnerability through, we'll fix the next release. You know, it's, we can fix three of eight. Or we'll just escalate this over your head. There's a bargain, rather than focusing on how to fix it, there's a focus on how do I bargain this away. And the next one is, is um, uh, I've had some time to put in here, but the, the tradition of the next stage is depression. And I've never actually seen a developer get depressed over security fine. I haven't. But what I have seen is if you've seen a developer who, developers who pride themselves on their work, you've seen them get angry at themselves. You've seen them lose enthusiasm for their project, and you've seen them, you know, lose their morale goes down and become irritable, and all those are symptoms of depression. So, yeah. 
Where do you see that virus more? Is, do you find more obstruction with, with self-management or, or, or with, you know, IT level guys? Uh, or, or where do you see well, that dividing? Where, where does it take more place? So the, my, this is just what my, my, my description here is with the software developers, but yeah, it's, it, it, if you're asking about roles, it probably, it, it would come on, the bar, it, would, it, 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 it depends on the role, right? So if, if I'm a yeah. subordinate, that manager's not gonna be real depressed, he's gonna be real angry with me, because there won't be bargaining, because he can, he can crush me, right? So it, the, it's, the, response, the response would be based on the role, what they can do about it. Because if, if a manager has the ability to make your test go away and make you go away, they're not gonna go through these five cycles because they've, they've squashed the problem. This is, this, this is really when you're talking to developers for the first time right. about an issue you found. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the last one is acceptance. And this is, this is I don't wanna make it sound all jubilant and over joyful, but the reality is, if you teach, once a developer understands security and gets the concept, they're gonna take a bigger interest in secure coding practices. They're gonna incorporate security testing. Whether you ask them to or not, they're gonna start testing their own code, and they're gonna start influencing their peers. And this is a, I wish I could put this picture on here because you don't have developers doing, yeah, I, was, I wrote bad code. But the reality is, <laughs> you know, the reality, I'm gonna, gonna take that picture off. But the reality is, if, when, once a developer has that aha moment, there's a certain aha moment where they get it, you're gonna see stuff like this. They're gonna become, they're gonna wanna learn more. They're gonna ask you more questions. They're gonna test their code. They'll say, gosh, Mike, can I have a scanner too? Okay. So working with QA people. This is, um, <coughs> uh, uh, this, meet your new best friend eventually. Because QA, I think it's, let's see. People that make test managers. Um, the reason, in my experience, the reason test managers don't include security testing is because they don't know they should. Um, what actually prompted my, what it prompted me writing this was a few years ago, I went into an organization that had huge, huge, huge amounts of sensitive data and no software security assurance process whatsoever. And I was brought in to bring to bring in some software security processes. And I wrote up a policy requiring security testing. And, 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 and then at this point, I'm fairly, I'm, I'm fairly high up in the food chain of this organization. At that point, I'm a, I'm a uh, director level person. And I get a very angry call from the VP of security testing saying, who do you think you are requiring security testing? And my first response was to tell them who I was, why I could do that, and what I was gonna I was gonna crush them. And I, but I, luckily I didn't. I, instead I said, it, sound, it sounds like you have some concerns about security testing. That's all I said. Sounds like you have some concerns. And they started to tell me there's some concerns, they couldn't think of any. All they knew was they knew nothing about it and it was scary to them. So I, I explained what, I explained the security test processes, I explained why they were a good fit that we did. I explained why they wouldn't hurt anything and by the end of the phone call, this person was my biggest ally and went on and, and helped me implement all kinds of security testing and, and really became, became a huge asset uh, to the security organization. And had I, had I said to her, I'm gonna crush you if you don't, we probably would have been enemies forever. And inst instead, uh, we had a very strong working relationship. So what I, what I documented here is for QA people, for test managers and QA people, it's their job. So tell them, tell them what you need. Tell them what you need from them for testing. Tell them how to do it, and get out of the way. Not that it's their day job. It's what they do. Um, and the, the next one's a good bullet. So with with security people, they've got to test against something, right? But wherever we put the slide out of their cheese, QA people have to be have to have a test plan to test against. They have to know what they have to know the binary yes no pass fail. If you just tell a test person, tell me if it's secure, uh, they've got nothing to test against. So one of the things I've had good luck doing is, is, is giving them a tool and using CWEs. So make sure there's no higher moderate CWEs. Um, and, and that's what they can test against. 
Yeah, and the, the last one is this is their chosen discipline. That's what they do. Give them the framework, give them the tools, give them the requirements, and, and, and lock away. <coughs> okay, Pro, program management. Um, and just for kicks, remember this blazer. Look at that blazer. It will, it'll come up later in this talk. Um, so pro, program, pro, project, program management offices, um, they get paid, like I said, to make things efficient, organized, and predictable. So when you bring a foreign concept to a, a program office and say, I want to introduce all this stuff, it freaks them out. Because they don't know what you're talking about, and what you're doing is you're screwing with their efficiency and predictability. <coughs> bring them examples, say, you know, these organizations have these processes in place. Bring up the SAM, bring up NIST. <coughs> whatever you can do, bring up whatever requirements you can. Alleviate their fear you're not crazy, and then give them a reason to do it. And if you tell you, if you give a program office the warm fuzzy that it won't break things, tell them why they need to, you've got an ally. <coughs> and this is, you can't, this is it's pure coincidence, but Two slides ago was my program office lady, different lady, project manager lady, same exact blazer, pure coincidence. <laughs> but pro I only, I've got very little on project managers, and, I'll, and, and here, <coughs> project managers get paid to, to execute the project schedule, okay, and they work for the program office. If you give a project manager a project schedule security testing, it'll get done. If you give a project manager a project schedule with no security testing on it and ask them to do it anyway, it'll never get done. So the, 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 the key to working with project, project managers is really easy. Five minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll speed things up. Um, long story short, get on the project schedule. If you don't want to do that, see the previous slides on who to influence. Um, I know if people, when I talk with several customers, they do not realize one single fact out there about the internet. And I think uh, RenderMan really points out this quite well. We are 100 milliseconds away from every jerk out there in the internet. In other words, it is not, I live in Puerto Rico, so I'm isolated, I don't have to worry about getting hacked.